Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Now that we can successfully import images, construct textures, save, load and view texture assets, I'd like to add a bit more functionality to the texture editor. We still can't view textures that use a block compression format. We are going to fix that in this video too. This is all rather easy stuff, so I hope you'll enjoy this video without a lot of hat scratching. Before working on the decompression API methods, let's quickly add a background grid to texture editor. I'm not going to use an image for this in order to keep it sharp and crisp while zooming in the canvas. I think we can even make it freeze in order to enable WPF to use it in a more optimal way. So this is just a collection of vertical and horizontal lines that make up the grid and we are going to use this visual brush as the background of the texture editor. Now you can see we have this background, but it doesn't pan with the image. That's what I'm going to fix next. Actually, first let me make sure that the checkerboard background of the image doesn't zoom in and out. I'd like the checker pattern to stay the same size regardless of the zoom value. This can be easily implemented by inversely scaling the viewport of the checkerboard. Now in order to make the background grid pan with the image, we have to recalculate the offset by which it should pan. We can easily find this offset by subtracting the pan offset's old value from the current pan offset. This is added to the viewport X and Y, which makes it shift with the same amount. Note by the way that we only do this if the grid background brush is a tile brush. Now we can see the grid moving as well. We can also have a look at the checkerboard, which now has a constant size. I see that we are missing a few grid lines here, so let me check if I forgot something. Ah uh, yes, I did. 
There should be a rectangle here which accounts for the main grid lines. This looks better now. Ok, cool. Now I would like to write the decompression API methods so that we can view textures with BC encoding. Oh, let me also remove this function call, which is not needed cause when we import a texture we don't have to fill in texture info since we don't have any information about the texture yet. So this call is unnecessary. I'm going to move these two methods up just to ease my OCD a little bit. Ok, so we have a C++ function which we can import as usual and we need a public method that calls the imported function and returns the list of slices. We need to create an instance of texture data, which is sent to the C++ site. We are going to get the data from the C-sharp texture class and fill it in texture data. This time we do have the texture information which we are expected to fill in, so we call get texture data info method. We get the import settings and copy sub resource data, which is done by a method that I'm going to write in a minute. Then we call decompress, passing it the texture data and check for errors when it returns. Now we need to write the method that copies the slices to a block of memory that can be accessed by C++ functions. Here we write the slices into a buffer first. Luckily we already have a method that does that for us. We only have to allocate memory and Marshall copy the buffer to that memory block. That's all we need to do to decompress BC textures. Now let's import an image and encode it as a BC7 texture and see if we can open it in the texture editor. I forgot to actually return the slices after decompression, which is kind of important, I think. Ok, let's drop another image onto the content browser and keep our fingers crossed. Nice, it imported successfully. I'm going to set a breakpoint here and make sure that it was indeed imported as a BC7 texture, which it is as you can see here. So that's promising. And we are also able to view the texture, which means that the decompression code also works as intended. Let's move on quickly cause we've got a lot of stuff to cover. Here I'm going to divide the editor's interface in order to place UI controls like buttons and sliders. As you can see I added a dock panel which is only enabled if the texture property of the editor is not null. Since this dock panel will contain everything in the editor's user interface, it will disable the whole texture editor as long as there is no texture set. Then I add a bar on top with a subtle drop shadow. It will contain the sliders and other controls.
will display the texture information on the left side of the editor and the right side will display the texture as it already does. I also add a grid splitter so that we can resize the panels somewhat. Next, we need to determine the maximum of each of the slice array dimensions. For example, the number of MIP levels depends on the image size and the import settings provided by the user. The same holds for the array and depth indices. We can determine these numbers simply by counting the slice array dimensions. However, max depth index also depends on which MIP level is currently being displayed. The array index is always zero in case of 3D textures, but I use it here just to denote which dimension contains what. Next, we need properties for the selected array index, depth index, and MIP index. We have to clamp each index so that they can't ever go out of range. Additionally, we need to notify the UI to update the selected bitmap when any of these indices change. When MIP index changes, the UI is also notified to update the max depth index because for 3D textures, each MIP level has a different number of depth slices, unless there is just one depth slice left. Finally, the max indices are also updated whenever a new bitmap array is generated. Now we can use these indices to get the selected bitmap and selected slice. Going back to the user interface, I'd like to add a few sliders that we can use to select which slice we want to see. Remember, a texture can be a single image with one or more MIP levels, an array of images with one or more MIP levels, or a 3D image with one or more MIP levels. In addition, we also have cube maps, which are basically texture arrays with an array size that's a multiple of 6. So we need to add three sliders, one for selecting MIP level, one for selecting the array slice, and one for selecting the depth slice. Although our code does support texture arrays and 3D textures, we have no means of assembling images and feeding them to the importer in a way that it would produce texture arrays or 3D textures. That will have to wait until a later episode, which will be out soon. For now, however, we can use a slider to select a specific MIP level. So I'm going to add all three sliders, but we can only use the one for MIP levels for now. The sliders that are not relevant for each texture type will be hidden, so they can't be used. The first slider is for selecting an image in a texture array. Its maximum value is limited by max array index and its value is bound to array index property. 
We can make a style for this slider and make it only visible if the texture isn't 3D and is a texture array with more than one element. We copy this code and reuse it for depth slider. We have to rename it and bind it to the appropriate properties. This slider will be visible if the texture is 3D. It will not be hidden, but disabled if max depth index is 0. This can happen if the selected MIP level doesn't have more than one depth slice. The final slider is for selecting the MIP level. Oh, I see I used the wrong slider property here. We should use the maximum property. The MIP slider is only visible if there is more than one MIP level. Ok, let's take it for a spin. Here we have an imported texture with 12 MIP levels, and as you can see, we can use the slider to change which MIP level is displayed. The image becomes smaller with each MIP level as expected. This is pretty much it for this episode. The next episode will be about enhancing this user interface and displaying information about the texture on the left panel. Hopefully there was something new for you to learn in these videos. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!